Thank you very much. Thank you to Stop the War and thank you all for inviting me, giving me the chance to have a few words about Iraq, how it is today. Uh, I'll speak about the humanitarian situation to start for a few minutes, then I move on to the political and I'll try to cover as well the military and the resistance because after all, I mean, the title of this event is the justice and resistance uh, in Iraq, Palestine and Lebanon. Uh, the humanitarian, I mean, we are in the seventh year of the occupation. Uh, the result, and very quickly, I mean, it's disastrous. Uh, for example, I shouldn't have been standing here speaking on behalf of Iraqi people. Uh, if we only had the chance to bring over from Iraq someone who represent, can represent the Iraqi resistance or even some feeling about the resistance in Iraq. It's almost impossible uh, to have a visa to this country now and allowed by the British government, no matter how much we try or how hard we try. Uh, and this is after all the claims of democracy, building the new Iraq and establishing human rights. Uh, humanitarian, there are more than one million, uh, million Iraqis being killed since 2003. All the figures I'm going to mention be taken from international organizations and humanitarian organizations, so they are well documented. 4.7 million are displaced internally inside Iraq, living in camps or nowhere, or uh, the rest are refugees outside the country. Very few of Iraqis are accepted and the main two countries responsible about the aggression on Iraq, i.e. Britain, the UK, and the US. It's very difficult even to visit these countries. Two million Iraqis have been detained, and that is at one time or another since 2003. Some of the detainees, whether it's they are in the US, control detention center or Iraqi controlled detention center being there for over four years without having enjoying any kind of legal rights, representation or visiting or any other, or even charged uh, regardless what is. But they are accused of being either terrorist, potential terrorist, Al-Qaeda uh, Al uh, fighters, or in some very few cases they are insurgents or officials from the previous regime. So it's a mix up, a bundle of everybody there, not knowing what's happening to the people. Up to 2007, the International uh, Cross Committee for Red Cross were telling us there were in Iraq, there are in Iraq now one million Iraqis being uh, missing. And this is uh, up to 2003, uh, uh, th there were 375,000 Iraqis missing because of the previous wars, uh, Iran, Iraq war and others, but it, the, the figure has been risen to 1 million since the occupation. This will give you an idea about how many families are living in limbo, not knowing what's happening to their bread uh, winners or uh, the, the male in the family, the brother, the father, or the, the husband. One million, and this is very low estimates because the International Red Cross saying between one to three millions Iraqi widows are there, and the average Iraqi family are with five children, so we have five million orphans. Uh, women are really, I mean, losing on achievements which they were established for since the 20th of last centuries in Iraq. Uh, the regression is huge on every single level. I mean, if we have the time, I would have spoken, but I don't have the time to go into details. Only 10% of those widows with their families are receiving some help from what's called the Iraqi government. The rest are relying on their own means. So, and it's very difficult with the unemployment, poverty and all. But we have to bear in mind that Iraq is not a poor country. The revenue of what's called the Iraqi government since 2003 is 177 billions from oil export alone. And that's all, it's been swallowed by the huge, the black hole of corruption. Iraq is now at the second level highest 
level country in the world of corruption and means of corruption we talk about. There is in general thing no reconstruction or hardly any reconstruction, uh, no development, they don't have plans for the economy, the development, and there is no encouragement for the manufacturing. In fact, many of the factories being closed down, and so a lot of goods, very cheap goods, are in the country now, imported from other places. So no industry and no farming. Uh, everything, the subsidies by the government disappeared gradually these years. This is the overall picture of what is. Just a note that the new budget for 2009, the Prime Minister Office, this is indicating the kind of corruption, the Prime Minister Office had in last year budget $60 million uh, expenses. Uh, and this year the budget has been risen, the expenses on his behalf is to $360 million. This is used to bribe people and buy people and various groups, tribal leaders, the corruption in, in the government or attracting people to stop uh, or to, to support, I mean, let's go. Uh, if we look at the political situation and what Obama's pr uh, promised as the withdrawal of troops, in fact, it's not the withdrawal of the troops. It's not that plan. The plan is to seek the best way of having the troops or having uh, a permanent stay of the Americans in Iraq and how to reduce the number of casualties with less uh, expenses. This is the whole idea, because with the biggest embassy in the world, in the heart of our capital, with 5,000 employees, mostly are the, what they call advisors, CIA, uh, security forces and all, we have that in the heart of our capital. The rest are all over in various bases. We don't know the exact figures of the American bases, but there are permanent American bases in Iraq. There's a rebranding of names now. The deployment or of the forces or not, they're going to be named. And the plan also, in addition to the 160,000 mercenaries fighting in Iraq, alongside the official American, uh, the British, and what's called the multinational forces, we are going to have an increase in the mercenaries armies because and instead of relying on the like of black water, and they proved to be very expensive, more expensive than American soldiers and the British soldiers, they're going to rely on training of African people and in Latin America, so that they're moving their training centers to this country, a third country, signing contract on the air between the two countries, and the salary of them, instead of the usual $15,000 per month, they are accepting $600 to $6,000 per month. So it is a huge reduction of the money, and they are much cheaper and uh, much quicker to train those people. So this is kind of the future, what the planning is going to happen. Uh, they relied, the, what's called the Iraqi government, on what they call the success by establishing the awakening of or as sahwa In fact, as I'm talking to you, there is a big fight in, in, in the middle of Baghdad, in the old city of Baghdad, called al fadl area, between the U.S. forces, the Iraqi forces, and as sahwa because now it's their contract with the U.S. has uh, expired, almost, there is no need for them anymore, and the Iraqi government doesn't need them, so they are starting arresting them. So this is kind of the backbone of what they call the process uh, establishing security is already fragmented. Uh, and this is what we were expecting all along because it's only the training of another militia, sectarian militia in, in Iraq, rather than finding a real uh, solution to the huge problems in Iraq. Uh, there are now average 80 detainees per day, the arrest going this way. So while they claiming the Americans we are releasing detainees, they are arresting new 80 detainees. So this is compensation, almost parallel what's happening. And still they are accused of being terrorist Al-Qaeda, though, I mean, Obama told us in his famous speech that Al-Qaeda has finished and the real danger in Iraq is no more the real danger, but it is in Afghanistan. 
So we should redeploy the forces to Afghanistan. But uh, again, this is a contradiction of what, what's happening. Uh, I get, the, the second point is why it's not really, I mean, the real danger in Afghanistan. If we compare the number of Iraq, of American soldiers being killed in, in, in Iraq in 2008, the figure is a 314, and that's compared with 155 in Afghanistan. So Iraq is not as stable for the American, for the occupation troops, as they like us to, to, to believe, or the whole world to believe. In one minute, I'll tell you why I think the resistance is continuing in Iraq and why it's going to continue to fight until the last soldier and the stooges in Iraq and the occupation forces, uh, regardless of what they're doing, because they are still fighting because it is a right to fight the occupation. And the number of operations now, despite all the difficulties, there is, you can hardly find an American soldier on Iraqi soil walking nowadays. Because every Humphi, every tank, you'll see they are ahead of it are Iraqi soldiers and behind it Iraqi soldiers. So they are well protected. And instead of walking in our streets, they are using drones and airplanes, air attacks. So they are Ira more Iraqi skilled on the ground rather than being fighting on the ground. And the number of operations every day, there is something between 25 to 30 average operations directly against the occupation forces. And this is a huge number compared with the kind of protection the occupation forces are seeking and uh, trying to, to remain safe in, in Iraq. Now, the last thing I would like to say that, and this is uh, during the daily attack, the Israeli attack on the Palestinians in Gaza, Iraqi resistance declared all the operations is for the support of Iraq, the uh, Gaza, Nusrat al Mujahideen fi Gaza, all the time. So it is the revenge for the attacks, the killing of civilians in Gaza. All the attacks by the Iraqi resistance against the occupation was named like that. And the three factions, different factions of the Iraqi resistance together work and they give them hell. And this is the only way, I mean, we must not follow or we say divide and conquer like they want us to do. The resistance is one because the occupation is one, whether it's in Palestine, in Lebanon, or in Iraq. Thank you very much. The Iraqi women, uh, in fact, to start with, they were very well protected by the society itself, especially in the first few years. Uh, well, we heard and we know that they were almost imprisoned at home because all male, male relatives, they were highly protective of them, so they stayed at home. Hence, we can see the percentage of the killing going on. Men were, uh, the percentage of men were killed much higher than women, the ratio. Though, I mean, we know as a fact in many conflicts that women are the main victims. So this protection was quite useful for women physically. But in the last couple of years, because women, men were targeted by names at checkpoints and through lists available to militias, so men started to stay at home. Women, we start to see them more in the streets. And the number of women were killed increased. There are various reasons for killing Iraqi women. First of all, either by the US troops, and they call it collateral damage. Uh, so they are, in that sense, more or less like men, uh, because some of them were ex baptists so they were targeted by the militias, again, for working or being. I mean, we know for a fact in the past, uh, we had one million Iraqis members of the Ba'ath Party, so the de process, which is absolutely horrible in Arabic, it's called the uh, uprooting, that's mean killing. So the killing of the ex baptists became legitimate in Iraq in the last six years. Women were included, whether we agree or don't agree, but these are where uh, a daily uh, committed crimes in Iraq. 
Uh, in fact, the Iraqi resistance, various factions of Iraqi resistance were well protective of women. And uh, I mean, for example, after the rape of Abir, the girl, the 13 years old girl in Mahmoudia uh, near Baghdad, and they killing her after the rape by the U.S. Marines, by five U.S. Marines, and they've been put on a trial, and then they burned her body and killed her parents and her little sister. Uh, the resistant led a complete attacks on the U.S., and three of the U.S. Marines were kidnapped and then killed after that under the name Nusrat al-Mu'minat, for the protection of the faithful, the Iraqi women, and what they called the honor of Iraqi women. And I'm, I'm going to quote two women. One of them is uh, Dr. Nawaz Samarai. She is an MP, so sh she is not exactly from the resistance. In fact, she is part of the uh, Iraqi, is the US-sponsored government in Iraq at the moment. Dr. Nawaz Samarai, I'm quoting her in a recent interview in the last two months. She said, Iraqi women are subjected systematically to abuse and rape whether they are under in the, uh, the detention centers or prison, whether it is under the US or the Iraqi uh, police and army. So both, and we have to bear in mind that the Iraqi police has been trained by the British and the Americans and specifically on um, human rights. The second quote, I'll, uh, the other side of the uh, equation, and this is Hana. Uh, Ibrahim, uh, a woman, Iraqi woman, leftist, activist, uh, anti-occupation woman who was, we had the pleasure of seeing her recently in London after struggling two years to get her a visa to come over here. And she gave figures, uh, she gave the statistics and the numbers and the cases, and she has a huge file of cases of women being killed. Not as we are told, like because of honor killing. No, it isn't honor killing. Honor killing will be done by a brother or an uncle or uh, someone. It used to be done secretly in a society, and we hardly heard about it in Iraq. But now we see bodies of women uh, scattered in areas, in various areas, sometimes 20 or three bodies, that, as they discovered in Basra. This is not honor killing. This is a crime committed to silence people, and it is done under the eyes of the what's called Iraqi government. And by the way, none of these crimes being investigated by the Iraqi government, none of them being investigated by the British envoy for human rights in Iraq, and no one's talking about it. But this is, and we have also to bear in mind, this is the women. Iraqi women who part of the invasion was the claim that we are going there to liberate them and protect their human rights. Thank you, Fatima.